Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Responding to Resistance, hosted by Sovereign Health Group. I would now like to introduce today's webinar speaker, Gloria Gonzalez, and Ruth Howard. Our first speaker, Gloria Gonzalez, she is PhD in LMHC. She is a senior clinician at Sovereign Health of Florida with 17 years of experience working with dual diagnosed populations. She also has interest in working with trauma patients. And our second speaker is Ruth Howard. She has done PhD in MSED. She is a postdoctoral fellow at Sovereign Health of Florida. She has interest in psychotherapy research and sociocultural issues. Let's welcome Ruth and Gloria to today's presentation. Well, thank you for that warm introduction. Thank you so much. Okay, to start with our presentation is divided in two main parts. The first one is theory. What is resistance? What does resistance occur? And the second part is practice. How can resistance be effectively attended to in therapy? And what does responding to resistance look like in therapy? So our desire today is to provide an overview of common reasons why resistance emerges present practical tools for therapists to use, and then provide examples of the tools being used in the context of therapy. So what is resistance? So to briefly explain, resistance is an internal process that occurs within our clients. It arises from interpersonal interactions, and then it becomes observable client behavior that occurs in the context of therapy. So what does resistance look like in the context of therapy? Client resistance can come in many forms at all times during the therapeutic process. It could be in non-verbal cues, could be in indirect statements, could be in direct statements and behaviors. As you can see, the pie chart has verbal as a 35% and the non-verbal cues, which is the majority, 65% could be the facial expressions, the tone of voice, movement, and overall attitude, the eye contact, the gestures, and the posture. So according to experts in a certain treatment modality um, of CBT, nonverbal cues and indirect statements may be attended to by consistently eliciting feedback from clients regarding your interventions and checking in with what they perceive. So, for instance, in regard to the nonverbal cues that Gloria mentioned, you can check in and ask if they're having a reaction to something you said or something you said had bothered them. Um, or you can ask the client directly if they could perhaps put in their own words what, what their confusion is. So by doing this, the therapist uncovers the existence of a problem in a number of ways. You're listening to the patient, you're responding directly to their needs, and soliciting their feedback. However, within this presentation, we'll continue to consider the direct statements and behaviors that client used to manifest the resistance. Okay, several psychological theories of personality include a classification system that catalogs types of defenses. For example, Freud identified patterns of resistance and classified them as different types of defenses. These include, as you can see, all the defense, repression, denial, projection. In addition, according to Irvin Yellum, during the course of therapy, the patient opposes what he perceives to be the will of the therapist. Freud labeled this opposition resistance, consider it an obstacle, and suggested various techniques such as patience, guidance, interpretation to overcome it. Both believed that resistance was a valid and important manifestation of counter will and as such must not be eliminated but instead supported and transformed into creative will. So familiarity with the classified defenses can assist therapists in recognizing client resistance when it's presented. It's beneficial because therapists who recognize resistance reactions can begin to respond to them. However, I must mention that identifying the behavior and classifying the type of defensiveness is only part of the solution. Because in clinical practice, telling patients that they're being resistant or exhibiting a defense mechanism is likely to compound the problem by eliciting more defensiveness. Clients might take that as an attack, or they might feel as though you're being critical and insulting. Yes, Ruth, you brought up a very important point, and it's consistent with research stating that clinical activities 
are most productive when there is a collaboration between patient and therapist. So why resistance is, um, resistance is important? Resistance behavior is more than just interesting information about the process of counseling. According to Miller and Rolnick, 2002, the developers of motivational interviewing, the more resistance a person feels during counseling, the less likely it is that behavior change will occur. So resistance can pose roadblocks to the therapeutic process and limiting that behavior change like Gloria mentioned. And it's also associated with treatment dropout. However, counseling style can affect the level of client resistance. It can drive it upward or downward. So as a result, resistance can create an opportunity in the therapeutic process. It can create an opportunity to gain additional insight into the problems the patient is experiencing and an opportunity to re-engage the client in the process of therapy. So if we fail to at least attempt to attend to the resistance in those therapeutic encounters, then we miss a big opportunity to prevent our clients from possibly terminating prematurely if we can. In order to understand why resistance occurs, it can be helpful to start back at square one. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, resistance is defined as refusal to accept something new or different an effort made to fight against someone or something. So our job as therapists is to consider what might they be possibly fighting against. So to understand this, it's important first to acknowledge that resistance is a normal reaction to change. Change is hard. It takes work. As you can see in the slide, according to Prochaska and DiClemente's trans-theoretical modern behavior change, it's a process. There's thinking involved, the preparation for the change to occur, the action steps involved in actually changing, and then maintaining that behavior. So the truth is resistance can occur at any point in this process. And the skillful handling of resistance is important throughout the course of therapy, like Gloria noted. Very well, some degree of caution and self-protection is a useful and even necessary component of effectively dealing with day-to-day -day pressures and interpersonal interactions in the real world. From this perspective, patient resistance becomes much easier to understand. So within the area of psychotherapy research, there's five common underlying reasons that our clients exhibit resistance, and we'll briefly explain each one. So the first one is the stigma of seeking help. So for many people, the very fact that they're seeking therapy is an admission of failure on some level, that there constitutes a serious threat to their self-esteem. The second one is a threat of betrayal. Given the client's past experiences, how can clients trust that the therapist will not betray them, as others seem to have done in the past? And the third one is the threat of change. So like I noted, change creates uncertainty. And as bad as their problem may be or may have been, it's familiar and it's known in a way that's safe. And they know what to expect. So change is work, and most of the time it's confusing. The fourth one is the threat of letting go of ways of coping. A therapist's attempts to help these clients may involve removing a valuable form of protection the client develop over time. It is understandable from this perspective why patients might receive such assistance. And the last common reason is the threat of acknowledging responsibility. So in reality, some of the client's issues that they're presenting with may not have been their own doing. So consequently, they may deny having the power to correct the problems, or they might defensively confuse taking responsibility with being at fault. In summary, as a clinician, the most constructive approach to resistance is to empathize and understand resistance from the client's experience and perspective. Given the, this, this brief introduction into what resistance is and why it occurs, we will now transition to discussing practical tools for therapists to use when they are faced with client resistance. 
So practically speaking, increasing our awareness really is the first step to attempting to empathize and understand where our clients are coming from in regard to resistance. So as a result, mindfulness may be a useful tool to facilitate the step of empathy and understanding within us as therapists. Realistically, our ability to empathize with our clients varies from day to day, depending on our stress levels and many other factors that may or may not be related to our client. And according to experts in the practice of mindfulness, there's a dearth of evidence saying that empathy can be taught. True empathy and a compassion for the suffering of others can arise, however, from the recognition that no one's free from suffering and that it's a universal truth that everyone wishes to be safe from it. So getting in touch with our capacity to suffer can help facilitate that empathy for resistant clients. For very difficult patients, we may require deeper attention. So it might be helpful to consider the part of the patient that does desire to be happy and loved. It may also be helpful to reflect on the pain and suffering the individual must be deeply experiencing that's causing them to push away the help that they desperately need. So now I'd like to engage you in a brief mindfulness exercise that you can use whenever you need to promote feelings of compassion towards a very difficult patient. So if you can find a comfortable seated position, and close your eyes, and just allow your body to be held by your chair. Just take a moment to notice the bodily sensations of contact with your chair and take a few deep breaths. Try to relax your abdomen and notice that the breath is already moving on its own. Try to follow the breath for a few moments. Now bring to mind a visual image or a felt sense of a patient for whom you have strong negative reactions. And imagine this person sitting across from you. Now imagine that you're emanating friendly warmth towards this difficult patient. Imagine emanating warmth and loving kindness. And take a moment to consider what makes this person unhappy? What might be motivating this person's action? If your attention wanders, simply try to return to the image and just emit warmth to that patient. When you're, when you're ready, open your eyes. Thank you for, for trying that exercise. Again, it's a tool that you can use whenever you're finding yourself having a strong negative reaction to a patient. So once we're emotionally prepared to engage our clients, our resistant clients, we're now ready to use more specific clinical techniques. The first set of techniques we will present include three different forms of reflection. Simple reflection, amplified reflection, and double-sided reflection. Reflective listening appears deceptively easy, but it can be a powerful tool that honors the client's statements and can diminish persistence. A good general principle is to respond to resistance with non-resistance. A simple acknowledgement of the person's disagreements, feelings, or perceptions can permit further exploration rather than continued defensiveness, thus avoiding the trap of taking sides. A reflective listening statement will often suffice for this purpose. Sometimes a small shift in emphasis can also be accomplished through reflection. And as a result of feeling heard and validated, the therapeutic relationship can be strengthened as well. So now we'll present two examples of this approach style. All right, here's our first example. Who are you to be giving me advice? What do you know about drugs? You've um, probably never even smoked a joint. Well, Gloria, it must be hard to imagine how I could possibly understand. 
Or you can say, it sounds like you're pretty angry at me. So those are two examples of a sim simple reflective statement. This technique re recognizes resistance in the form of the attack, and the client is trying to push the therapist away instead of engaging with the issue at hand. So the risk reflection creates an opportunity for the therapist to re-engage the client and explore the real problem, which is the misunderstanding or potentially the anger that's there. It also prevents our own counter-transference and prevents us from engaging in an argument. The next example. I just don't want to take pills. I should be able to handle this on my own. So you don't think that medication will work for you? All the therapist can say, it sounds like you don't want to rely on a drug. It seems to you like a crutch. This technique allows the therapist to reflect and explore the patient's thoughts about medication. The reflection also disengages the therapist from the trap of engaging in an argument. Paraphrasing enhances reflective listening. Okay. All right, the next technique is amplified reflection. It's a related and useful response that reflects back what the person has said in amplified or more exaggerated form. If successful, this will encourage the person to back off a bit and will elicit the other side of their ambivalence. This must be done empathically. We emphasize again that such reflections must be made in a straightforward, supportive, matter-of-fact manner. Any vocal hint of sarcasm, irony, or impatience can quickly recast your response as hostile and thus elicit patient resistance. I couldn't just give up drinking. What would my friends think? So it seems like you couldn't handle your friends' reactions if you quit. So a statement like this helps the client engage in more flexible thinking and consider the other side of their ambivalence. In addition, if done empathically, it does not attack or shame the client. So now for our next example. My parents are always exaggerating. I haven't ever been that bad. It seems to you like they have no reason for concern. This amplified reflection reduces resistance by allowing them to process their thoughts and feelings and not allowing the resistance to derail the session. Okay, another approach within the realm of reflective listening is to capture both sides of ambivalence. So if the person's recent statement manifests only one side of their argument, a double-sided reflection acknowledges and validates what the patient has said and then adds to it the other side of the ambivalence. This requires use of material that they have said in the past and it may exemplify inconsistencies in what they have said as well. So the client has stated previously, perhaps not even in the same session, um, something that's inconsistent. As a result, the therapist avoids taking sides and maintains a balance of emphasis. I know that you're trying to help me, but I'm just not going to do that. So you know that there are some real problems here that I'm trying to help you with. And at the same time, when I suggest, it's just not acceptable to you. So as you notice here, the use of and is used rather than but. And that's meant in order to, again, gain that balance of perspective. Look, I don't smoke more than most of my friends. What's wrong with having a joint now and then? You've told me how you're concerned about your smoking and how it affects you, and also it seems like you are not using any more than your friends do. I can see how this is confusing for you. Hard to sort it out. This technique combines a double-sided reflection and a simple reflection at the end in order to reduce resistance. Again, this type of intervention maintains a balance of emphasis from the therapist. 
Okay. Well, in addition, there are five other practical tools that move beyond reflection and offer a bit more direction for the clients. So these include shifting focus, reframing, agreeing with the twist, emphasizing personal choice and control, and coming alongside. One approach is to shift the person's attention away from what seems to be a stumbling block in the way of progress. This amounts to going around barriers done rather than trying to climb over them. Such detouring can be a good way to address or at least postpone dissonance when encountering a particularly difficult issue. The general structure of shifting focus response is to first diffuse the initial concern and then direct attention to a more readily workable issue. Here is an example. Well, now that I'm here, I guess you are going to tell me that it's all my fault. Well, I understand that you're worried about it being your fault. But it's not going to help us to place blame. I am concerned, though, that there have been some rather painful things happening in your life. Tell me a little bit more about that. So shifting focus reduces feelings of judgment from the client in this situation and gets to the important issue at hand. It's a person-centered approach of genuine regard for the patient and it can help reduce resistance. Okay, the judge said I had to come here, so tell me what I have to do. I am glad that you are invested in your recovery, but the truth is that I really do not know enough about you yet for us to even start talking about what makes sense for you. What we need to do right now is explore what seems to be the issue. This technique, applied as here, shifting focus reduces the defensiveness and allows the therapist to structure the therapy session. In the next slide, we move to the second advanced type of intervention. So reframing. Another response to resistance is to reframe what the patient is offering. So this approach acknowledges the validity of the person's observations and offers a new meaning or interpretation for them. So it's not just shifting focus, it's offering a new interpretation. The client's information is recast into a new form and viewed in a new light that will hopefully support change. I can hold my liquor. If I'm not feeling anything, how can I be drunk? Well, what you're talking about, being able to hold your liquor, that's not really your body's ability to get rid of alcohol at a superhuman speed or anything. The alcohol is still there. It's doing its damage. What you're talking about is tolerance. Your warning system is blocked, and that's a real reason for concern. So this example shows how reframing can involve some detailed teaching, communication of new information that the person needs in order to understand his or her situation in a different light. Often reframing is much simpler it can be accomplished with just a few sentence, sentences. Excuse me. Here's another example. <clears throat> I've tried to quit smoking three times now and failed every time. I don't think I can do it. What strikes me is that you have given in three good tries already. You're very persistent, even in the face of discouragement. This change must really be important to you. You remember that wheel of change we talked about? Every time you give it a good try, you are one turn closer to getting off the wheel so you don't give up now. In this case, reflaming client's negative perspective into encouragement and emphasizing capabilities disarms the patient's inner critic. So agreeing with the twist. So you often hear that to respond to resistance, we need to roll with it. And a related way of rolling with resistance is to offer initial agreement, but with a slight twist or change in direction. So this re retains a sense of consonance between you and the patient while allowing you to continue influencing the direction and the momentum of the change. Agreement with the twist is basically a reflection followed by a reframe, but it's more directive and hopefully leads to promoting additional change. Nobody can tell me how to raise my kids. You don't live in my house. You don't know how it is. 
You're right. You are in the best position to know which ideas are likely to work and which aren't for you and your children. The truth is that it's really up to you and how you are, on how your kids are raised. At the same time, we need to be a full partner in this process. So here we have a framing and a bit of a directive. The reflection reduces resistance, and the reframe validates the client's need for control in this instance. In addition, the directive informs the client how to change. In this situation, it's to engage in the therapeutic process. You're probably going to give me a diet that I need to stick to and tell me I have to get some of these exercise machines or go to a gym every day. I just get so discouraged by that kind of advice. If I were to tell you a whole lot of things that you have to do, it will immobilize you even further. It's ironic, isn't it? When you feel like you have to do something, it actually prevents you from doing what you want to do. By using this technique, it recognizes the resistance in a validating way. Okay, resistance sometimes arises from the phenomenon of psychological defensiveness. So when people perceive that their freedom of choice is being threatened, they tend to react by asserting their liberty. You know, saying, I'll show you, nobody tells me what to do. It's a common and natural reaction to a threatened loss of choice. So probably the best antidote for this reaction is to assure the person of what is the truth, that in the end, it truly is the patient who determines what happens. And an early assurance of this kind can diminish resistance. Okay, so emphasizing choice is our fourth technique. And it offers options, it promotes decision making, it reduces feelings of helplessness, and it empowers the client's freedom of choice. I don't want to take segments. Well, it really is your decision. All I can do is tell you the advantages and disadvantages for you and give you my opinion. If you decide you don't want to take the medication, then you won't. If you do want to, it's always available. It's completely up to you. So again, this technique, it offers the options, it encourages the decision to be made by the patient themselves, thereby reducing helplessness, and, and it empowers the client's freedom of choice. Okay. My family gave me an ultimatum. I have to come here. I don't have any choice about it. Actually, you do have choices. You chose to come here instead of taking your chances with the consequences of losing your family. By empowering the client, by giving the client back control over his decision making, he's recognizing the client's ability to take into consideration consequences. The next slide will present the fifth technique. If taken up, coming alongside. If taken up one side of the argument causes an ambivalent person to defend the other, then the process ought to work both ways. When a professional advocates for change, the ambivalent person argues against it. But what happens if the counselor defends the other side, the counter-change side? Coming alongside as the patient argues against change is just another way of diffusing the argument and eliciting change talk. There is a clear and immediate test of whether this response is having the desired effect. Does it decrease resistance and evoke change talk? Consistent with the example of exploring one side of ambivalence at a time, one can set up a direct debate in which the patient defends the need for change. So in many ways, coming alongside shifts the paradigm of resistance, it pulls facilitates alignment with the client, diffuses argumentation, allows the client to consider another perspective, and ultimately can lead to eliciting change talk. I don't think this is going to work for me either. I feel pretty hopeless. Well, it's certainly possible after giving it another try that you still won't be any better off. So it might not be better to try at all. What do you think? So this alignment with the patient demonstrates flexibility and hopefully will elicit change talk as the client can argue for the other side. I'm not sure if I want to do this program or not. It sounds like it takes a lot of time. And that's something that concerns me. A program like this does require a lot of motivation and effort. 
we don't really want to start working with someone until they're serious about wanting to change. And frankly, I'm not sure how ready you are. What do you think? This approach invited the patient to process self-discovery that's reducing resistance. This concludes our presentation of vignettes presented here to illustrate opportunities for the therapies to reduce patient's resistance. So that was the last of the five techniques beyond reflection. So just to summarize, resistance again, it's a natural and expected part of the therapeutic process, the natural part of the process of change. And understanding resistance fosters empathy within us and within the relationship. Responding to resistance effectively in therapy leads to an improved therapeutic alliance and techniques focus on invalidating the client's feelings as well as facilitating the therapeutic process. And here's a brief summary of the technique. Reflection, simple, amplified, and double-sided. You have the other techniques beyond reflection, shifting focus, reframing, agreeing with a twist, emphasizing choice and coming alongside. And finally, here are our references if you're interested in additional information for any of the things that we mentioned. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria and Ruth. We are now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, we can still submit questions through the questions pane in your Sandy control panel. Let me check the questions. Okay, we have first question from Kelly Smith, and that's, can you further explain the difference between coming alongside and agreeing with the twist? Okay, very well. Okay, well, ultimately, they're, they're very similar. Um, <clears throat> agreeing with the twist, you know, it blends the reflection statement with the reframe, and it has, you know, the initial agreement, um, but then it includes, you know, a shift in focus at the end. Coming alongside really is, it's kind of a more paradoxical intervention. You're, you're just basically going alongside with what the patient is saying is saying, you know, you're right. This, this is challenging. You know, what do you think? Do you think you're ready for this? So it's a little bit different. Um, you're not really offering another directive. You're, you're, you're naming what the, the resistance is saying and, and saying, you know, that does sound hard. What do you think? So it's, it's a little different that way. And I agree with you, Ruth. And coming alongside has an element of flexibility from the therapist's point of view, that the therapist is flexible enough and skillful enough to kind of be alongside with the client and still elicit change. So as a different with a twist is presenting the other side of perception. Okay, so with a twist is having a little bit of the interpretation of the therapist. And, uh, and coming alongside, flexibility is the important thing. Yeah, you're not really presenting the other side. You're just kind of coming alongside of them. But in reality, they're all a little bit, you know, they're all a little similar. So that's a great question. It can be hard to differentiate, differentiate some of them. <clears throat> great question. I hope we answered. Yes, you did. Uh, okay. Let me move to the second question, and that's from Ida Duplishan. And the question is, in the coming Alongside technique, what do you use to maintain the boundaries? Well, that's a good question. Okay, I'm becoming flexible. It doesn't mean that I am agreeing to everything that the therapist says. It is that I am flexible, but I keep my therapist hat. I understand, but I still focus on the therapeutic alliance. Coming alongside, it doesn't mean that we turn into bodies or friends. It means that I'm flexible enough, that I'm not negative and open to his uh, input and the way the person sees reality. Mm -hmm. But it really doesn't make us immediately friends. That's a good point. There's an element of normalizing the resistance there as well. You know, that perhaps, you know, it seems like this is hard for you. And a lot of people mention that, you know, but you know, what do you think? What's in it for you? Or maybe that's more of a twist. but there, there can be that boundary maintained even though you're exploring the resistance. But that's a good thing to keep in mind. It's always important to keep in mind boundaries. Absolutely. I hope this answered your question. Yes. And uh, 
third question I have that's from Liz Haynes and it goes what would you say to someone what does not acknowledge that they have a mental health diagnosis and that's a very good point so I will say well look at the consequences Let, let's look and let's explore so a little bit of reframing a little bit of reflection with a twist that is having consequences for you I understand that you the need of you to say face or the need of you to see things in reality, but let's look at your behavior. So agreeing with the twist also. Alright. And I have other question from Vanessa Pages. And she's asking, what do you do with the client that walks out of the group? Well that's a great question. I mean in many ways your hands are tied as a therapist leading the group. Um, I think one technique is to, you know, talk, communicate with them after, after the group about, about what happened. Um, but hopefully you can kind of engage that while they're in the process of getting up or you can see some nonverbal cues prior to them getting up and to see if they have any reactions at that point. Um, but within a group process, um, that, that can be pretty challenging to address uh, a group member who just leaves. Yeah, what I recommend is not to stop the group, obviously, because the other attendees have the right to continue with the group. And but uh, as my colleague said, uh, Ruth, uh, you said that we address that afterwards. If the person walks out of the group, it is nothing. I cannot stop at that moment, but I have to handle the resistance afterwards. Thank you. Um, we have received a few more questions. Okay, perfect. And that's from Carol Crow. And she's asking, are these suggestions culturally matched to the following populations? The first one is migrant farm workers. The second one is Native Americans residing on reservations. The third one is lower cognitive capacity. The fourth one is autism spectrum disorder clients. With above, a break, uh, with above average IQ and the last question is, okay, first you can uh, answer this question, then I'll move to the next question. Uh, it's not clear what is really the question. How do we handle these populations? Is that the question? Um, okay, let me repeat that. Uh, the question is, are these suggestions culturally matched to the following populations? Oh, okay. Um, in many ways, yes. I, I appreciate being mindful of you know the cross-cultural um, piece. I think that's an important piece. Um, but in some ways, some of these tools do honor the patient. They're you know person-centered in some ways of honoring and naming the resistance um, and not just minimizing and ignoring it. So in some ways, I feel like these could be used with different populations, but you obviously want to be sensitive to to that and to to what they're bringing in. Um, I think with some of you know with anyone really, but in some of those populations especially, there's a sensitivity um, that they're being criticized or a sensitivity to insult and things like that. Um, so perhaps some of the more directive ones, um, you want to you know wait until you have a better relationship or better rapport to engage in some of those, but for sure the reflecting and just naming the resistance can be a useful tool with those populations. Okay, another way is that our techniques in the majority and all of them are person-centered, thus being very culturally sensitive to the different populations, and just agreeing and paraphrasing, it could be a great tool even for autistic spectrum and from people who come from another cultures. I hope this answered the question. Yes, and uh, I'm moving to the last question of today, and that's from Michael Nolan, and he's asking, how do you handle clients who compare their substance use mental health issues with their peers' issues? Yeah, as you can see in one of our slides, when the, uh, the person was comparing herself or himself with the other friends, so the reflective part of coming alongside and acknowledging that yes, you must be pressure about your friends and it is in your culture. 
So let's invite you to reflect on what is right or wrong for you. And acknowledging that peer pressure of the group and it's a, a, you know, a, a way to handle that resistance and that comparison. All right, well, thank you so much, Glory and Drew. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Uh, people who have uh, questions, whose questions are still unanswered, I request Glory and Drew to answer to those questions separately. And yes. uh, if they have any further questions, they can send their queries at cu at solver.com or webinar at solver.com. And once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a thank you email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to event feedback form. And we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. In this email, you will also receive a recording of today's webinar. This presentation will be available to watch after 72 hours. You will receive an email with all the information pertaining to this webinar and how to earn one free CE soon. Thank you for your participation. We hope you found this information valuable. Goodbye.